Paul Truth beyond their initial knee-jerk reactions. I am sick of their smugness and snark. I am not sick of their smugness and snark. I enjoy it. A couple of lefties who have created a fantastic podcast, If Books Could Kill. This is from their episode on the 48 Laws of Power. Honesty rarely <laughs> strengthens friendship. Don't tell people stuff. It's, it's not just like, oh, does this guy have friends? It's also like, has he like read a book with right. their friends? <laughs> Just as a sociological phenomenon, right. as he like, Googled. Have you, like, seen a movie where two people have a, <laughs> have a friendship? If you watch Google Hunting, it's actually a speech that Ben Affleck gives. <laughs> the, the, what's funny about this chapter is that, like, the actual advice that he gives is just, like, if you need to do business stuff, don't hire your friends. That's, that's good not advice, terrible advice. Not, not because your friends are, like, evil and scheming. I know, but it's like he, he expresses it in, like, the most sociopathic way possible. But what we're diving into, Peter, you're, you're, you're seeing this, like, this kind of general rule of, like, friends are bad, right? And you're like, mm -hmm. okay, what example is he going to give, right? Because every law has these fucking anecdotes in it, right? And they have these, like, fables and shit on, like, the margins. Is this just going to be like Caesar? No, this is, so he, he illustrates this with a fable. Okay. It's a little bit long, but to me, it's important to like really revel in the story and like get the full picture. Actually, why don't I send it to you? So this is like, he says like African proverb or something. I, I don't know where he's pulling this from. Africa. A snake chased by hunters asked a farmer to save its life. To hide it from its pursuers, the farmer squatted and let the snake crawl into his belly. But when the danger had passed and the farmer asked the snake to come out, the snake refused. It was warm and safe inside. On his way home, the man saw a heron and whispered what had happened. The heron told him to squat and strain to eject the snake. When the snake stuck its head out, the heron caught it, pulled it out, and killed it. The, the farmer was worried that the snake's poison might still be inside him, and the heron told him that the cure for snake poison was to cook and eat six white fowl. You're a white fowl, said the farmer. He grabbed the heron, put it in a bag, and carried it home, where he hung it up while he told his wife what had happened. I'm surprised at you, said the wife. The bird does you a kindness, rids you of the evil in your belly, saves your life, yet you catch it and talk of killing it. She immediately released the heron and it flew away. But on its way, it gouged out her eyes. Oh, what is the lesson here? What? I don't even understand the ostensible <laughs> theoretical reason for the bird gouging out the wife's eyes. Exactly, she's the good one in the story. It's literally like, if you try to be nice, it will backfire because the person you were nice to will take advantage of you, possibly attack and try to kill you. What the fuck is this? Also, what was this snake's plan for the next several days? We're then, we're gonna do one more of these, Peter. Okay. In law three, conceal your intentions. He says, most people are open books. They say what they feel, blurt out their opinions at every opportunity and constantly reveal their plans and intentions. Many believe that by being honest and open, they are winning people's hearts and showing their good nature. They are greatly deluded. Honesty is actually a blunt instrument, which bloodies more than it cuts. Your honesty is likely to offend people. It is much more prudent to tailor your words, telling people what they want to hear, rather than the coarse and ugly truth of what you feel or think. During the War of the Spanish Succession in 1711, the Duke of Marlborough, head of the English army, wanted to destroy a key French fort because it protected a vital thoroughfare. Yet he knew that if he destroyed it, the French would realize what he wanted. Instead, he merely captured the fort and garrisoned it with some of his troops, making it appear as if he wanted it for some purpose of his own. The French attacked the fort and the Duke let them recapture it. Once they had it back, though, they destroyed it, figuring that the Duke had wanted it for some important reason. Now that the fort was gone, the road was unprotected, and Marlborough could easily march into France. What the fuck is what? I thought, like, it, conceal your intentions is really, really good advice if you are in the midst of medieval warfare <laughs> the ability of that to translate to my everyday life where most of my interactions are with the kebab guy i just don't see it like what what does this even get me like in the workplace context this is what is so fascinating to me it's like after i tried several times to read this book i did make it through one recent robert green book but uh I've tried various times to get through his books and, and given up. I think their critiques are pretty fair here. After a while, the anecdotes get very repetitive. It's like ancient China, the Roman Empire, ancient Greece. He has mm -hmm. a bunch of stories of Nikola Tesla, like a ton of stories about Nikola Tesla. He has a bunch of like uh, Louis the Fourteenth, like French court, pre-revolution France things. Sure. He does not have, I'm not exaggerating, a single anecdote in this entire book from an office. <laughs> give you this like, little aphorism. Like, oh, I see your intentions or something. And then the next paragraph will be like, in 252, the emperor so-and-so of China wanted to conquer the general something something and you're like why am i hearing this <laughs> i'm just picturing jay-z reading this shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why he has so many lyrics about the duke of marlborough <laughs> a huge percentage of this book is basically just like unbelievably oh oh gosh so racist thinking that a, a an accomplished black musician like jay-z would not be up to reading an intellectually formidable tone by robert green so racist sociopathic advice right law seven let others do the work for you but always take the credit no doubt law 12 use selective honesty and generosity to disarm your victim he uses the word victim throughout which i think is weird <laughs> in that law victim is like like your friend right yeah, okay. like what, or like the, my co-worker who didn't get the promotion and i did right in law 14 pose as a friend work as a spy he has this whole thing about like crush your enemies completely and again you're just like robert i work at quiznos i don't have like enemies i'm trying to think of where this would apply the most and maybe it's like if you're like a cabinet member or something he actually uses a ton of examples from henry kissinger yeah. And like, yeah, if you're the secretary of state and you're dealing with like weird conniving other heads of state and like you kind of are in some way engaged in some of these like power battles. Right. Then like, yeah, some of the stuff is useful. Conceal your intentions. Right. Like you, you've, you've sort of like literally dedicated your life to the pursuit of power. Right. You're not coming into contact day to day with people 
who you're just trying to like build fulfilling relationships with. Right. If you're living Henry Kissinger's life, you are a sociopath and you have chosen yeah. <laughs> the life of a sociopath, you know? So I, before we get to the other categories of information this book contains, I just want to talk a little bit about like the specific kind of sociopathy that he's promoting here. Uh -huh. So in the intro, he says, genuinely innocent people may still be playing for power and are often horribly effective at the game since they are not hindered by reflection. Once again, those who make a show or display of innocence are the least innocent of all. You can recognize these supposed non-players by the way they flaunt their moral qualities, their piety, their exquisite sense of justice. But since all of us hunger for power and almost all of our actions are aimed at acquiring it, the non-players are merely throwing dust in our eyes, distracting us from their power plays with their air of moral superiority. Uh, this is, this is just what Republicans believe. Mm. You see it all the time in the language they use when they talk about virtue signaling, for yeah, yeah. example, um, which, you know, I think you can say is a real thing, but they are obsessed with the idea that progressives who talk about morality and, you know, doing the right thing, et cetera, are faking it. Right. And in fact, they have these devious plans. Right. And that's because they accept this framing of the world where everyone is scheming out for power, out for themselves. Yeah. You yeah. can read a paragraph like this and the conclusion might as well be like, and this is why we need more police on the streets. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like either play the Game of Thrones or get little finger blasted. <laughs> this is what he's laying out. I like how you did your own spin on an already perfectly sufficient line from Game of Thrones. When you play the Game of Thrones, you live or you die. Okay, you could have just said that, but no. <laughs> you said finger blasted on blue sky the other day and I was like, I don't know when I have heard that term other than like eighth grade and like right now. <laughs> it's like such a disgusting term. This is what I get for doing a podcast with a straight man. It is. Because the last time, the last time I heard it was like a month ago. Okay, uh, me and the boys talking <laughs> i did actually look this up because i, I, I was really I, I was really struck by this too i was like this is a worldview that i do not recognize at all everything is this battle for power and even people who are acting kind right. have evidence that they're trying to manipulate me right i started looking around and there is an actual concept in psychology called zero-sum ideology uh -huh. and this is basically the idea that every single interaction between two people has to have a winner and a loser okay which is actually relatively widespread in the population you can read people these scenarios of like dave put his car on craigslist and then like jessica bought the car and then you ask me like okay who won the interaction i'm like oh dave won the interaction <laughs> right. there's, there's no reason to think of this as like one person won and the other person got cucked in that exchange it's just like yeah. two people engaging in a mutually beneficial activity but there, there there's obviously a spectrum and so on the sort of extreme cuck end where I am of this, there are people who have what's called zero-sum aversion, where people actively avoid situations that are just objectively zero-sum, right? If, if I win a tennis game, you lose a tennis game. And so people like me who are super conflict-averse just like don't really like playing tennis or like doing those kinds of competitive Okay, let's, uh, let's move to the topic. Our co-workers, can, can they be your friends? Should they be your friends? Is your workplace a family? Also, I do want to caveat to say that I'm not saying okay, that you're professional the so that none of them bite you in the butt. Now, if you're ready to jump into it, you've got your tea, give me a thumbs up. There is a very good likelihood that you see your colleagues more than you see your own family on a week to week basis. That, that's true, right? I mean, you work a normal job. You're in the office 40 hours a week. You're going to spend far more time with your colleagues. And if they're not horrible, you're going to develop a, a connection with them to varying degrees. And so just the normal default that you're spending so much time around them, many of them are going to become friends. That's my experience. They become friends, but yeah, they're situational friends. And when you move on from that job, then very few of them are going to stay in your life. But I've gotten into trouble here. I have often sought inappropriate relationships in the workplace uh, because I didn't want to do the work. Instead, I wanted to like get tight and get deep with, with people instead of doing my job. And so uh, I, these are the type of videos that uh, a younger me really needed to hear because I didn't want to work. I just wanted to bond. I wanted to get deep. I wanted to reenact my... You know, my inner drama, I wanted to share laughter and love and light. And especially when you have one of those really close-knit office cultures in an open office when everyone's up in each other's business, it's really easy to cultivate these artificially close relationships. You're going through so many of the same things. You have so much common ground. But the thing that starts to the blur of the lines is where the professional line ends and where the personal line begins. Here's the thing. I want you to remember... I've had a lot of trouble with this. All right, I remember early on in therapy, one of the first things my therapist talked to me about was boundaries. I uh, didn't really know much about them, but uh, I was just routinely violating other people's boundaries, like inappropriately touching them, inappropriately saying things to them. I was allowing other people, in fact, inviting other people to ride roughshod over what should have been my own normal, natural, healthy boundaries. And so e even today, I'm still kind of stunned how I invite disrespect from 
you know, so many people in real life. And I'm creating that, right? I'm building that because I am showing way too much inappropriate levels of vulnerability. This is uh, Heidi Pree. Or pain or breakups or whatever it is that has been painful for us interpersonally. But I think that a lot of us have a kind of gut instinct around times when we feel like we should be over something by now, but we're not. And a lot of the time, if the thing that we're having trouble getting this video really helped me because if you watch my, my videos, you know, I was like wondering why, why do I encourage disrespectful treatment in real life so often? Why do I encourage so many people to treat me in real life with, with you know, disdain and contempt? And it's because I am way overdoing the vulnerability. I am oversharing. I am seeking, you know, inappropriate relationships, you know, way too intense, like not, not appropriate to the context. And uh, I found this, this video by Heidi Preeb, graduate student in psychology. She's uh, researching attachment theory. I, this really helped me. This, this answered this question I had, why am I routinely getting treated with disrespect by people in my real life? Getting over is a situation. And I'm not talking about getting disrespected you know, online. I just take that for granted. I mean, that's the, the whole you know, nature of the bargain that we, we're making here together. I, I'm talking about in real life. Why? Why, oh Lord? And I am creating that by overdoing the vulnerability, inappropriately being vulnerable, inappropriately seeking inappropriately intense and inappropriate relationships in inappropriate places and times. In which we made ourselves vulnerable, but did not receive the response that we wanted or maybe were hoping for, or maybe it was a relationship that... Yeah, I guess I, I did that to try to manipulate people into liking me. That we chronically made ourselves vulnerable within and we can't seem to move on. If this is the case for you, if you feel as though you have an abnormally difficult time moving on after showing your vulnerabilities. Ah, uh, Brandon, great point. Boundaries never occur to victims of uh, child abuse. Yeah. I mean, I was, to the best of my knowledge, never sexually abused, but I was bounced off the walls for, for years. I was, you know, smashed about physically when I was a kid and I still. To, to people who know me in real life, I still emit many of the signs of the, the beaten stray dog. You know that stray dog who's been beaten a lot and you simply like raise your hand to scratch your nose and the dog, you know, leaps and bounds away because he's so scared. I, I still remind many people of that beaten stray dog. It's, it's probable that you are outsourcing too much when you share yourself vulnerably. So what do I mean by that? It might mean that when you go into a situation where you're sharing yourself with someone, when you are trying to make yourself open and telling someone who you are, you are not. Oh, apologies. I got, oh, thank God. Elliot Blatt is still, Elliot, Elliot, I, I hope I'm not being inappropriately vulnerable with you right now. Uh, no, no, you're not. Uh, I'm just having a big accident. I'm driving. Uh, blessings. This, 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 commentary, this, this commentary is terrible, Luke. You're, you're, you're really off base on this one, bro. These people are crazy. They don't, they're not worthy of reading such a book. The 48 Laws of Power? Yeah. They just don't get it. They're too dumb. They're too dumb to understand how, what the author is trying to communicate here. And they're just reading it at such a superficial level. They're just giving like Daily Show tier, you know, ironic takes. They're not, they don't grasp the essence of what's being conveyed here. And really talk to us, what's the essence of the 48 Laws of Power? It's how the world works, bro. It's how the world actually works. And, and how did this book affect or improve your life and your understanding of reality? Dude, I stopped making so many dumb mistakes. So many naive mistakes. I still make mistakes, but I've been able to cut back on them, right? And not fall into these pitfalls that I used to fall into because I misunderstood power dynamics. It's really like, it's the best software upgrade you can get for your brain, bro. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. I, I, I think you, you, you got to stop listening to these glib leftists, bro. They're just, they're, they're bad for you. You got to... You're really, you're really off base on this. You're, you've really fallen into uh, error here, my dude. 
Uh-oh, I'm in error. And uh, I mean, talk to me. Give me give me more about how how this book has Im improved your life and allowed you to make Elliot great again. Okay, what is the courtier? How to be a courtier? What it means to be a courtier and courtier, a courtier, uh, how you um, behave among people who have more power than you. Like how, what rookie mistakes you don't make. Like don't flatter. Don't use flattery. Flattery is, uh, will set you out. You become a marked man. You have to be much subtler. You have to learn how to navigate the subtle dynamics of being in a situation where there's one person that has much more power than you. Most people, they lose jobs, they don't get promotions, they get fired, you know, they, 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 they just misplay their hand because they don't know how to, be I used to be like this, I didn't know how to act around powerful people. That's a really and, important lesson, bro. Yeah, talk to me more about more effective ways of acting around powerful people. Okay, you need, you need to, you, all right, one is the first lesson, don't outshine the master, right? Yeah, don't outshine don't, the boss. Yeah. Don't try to prove to someone with more power than you that you're more intelligent than, than they are. That's just a bad idea. Yeah. Don't try, to, don't try to take the stage away from somebody. You know, during a meeting, if they have the power, you have to, you, you, you remember uh, Trump's show way back when? I never really watched it much. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the Apprentice. You're fired. Yeah, you're that fired. That was a perfect example, right? Yeah. Those people were trying to navigate uh, a scenario in which they had to demonstrate competence, but they couldn't. They couldn't be. They couldn't show any rough edges of their character, right? And Trump was there at the center of it all, uh, you know, chastising them for one reason or another, but. but it's the perfect example of, you know, navigating power dynamics. So uh, a while ago, I had a job where I was very, very busy. So when the important people would come ask me to do a task, I'd say, could you put it in an email? I'm just overwhelmed right now. And they didn't seem to appreciate that. No, <laughs> no, right, right. And the thing is, it's like, yes. So if you're in a subordinate relationship, right? Yeah. And your employer, your the person with more power is not looking for a friend. They want a subordinate. And you have to act like a subordinate. Even if you don't think you're, you know, a subordinate. If you don't act like a subordinate, you're going to cause problems. You're going to be shown the door one, one way or another eventually. So if I tell them that the podcast that they like to listen to a moronic, uh, not a good idea. That's not a good idea, bro. <laughs> okay. I, I, I made that well mistake. Well played, dude. Well played. I made that mistake a few times. Also, I told the boss that his dog was ugly. Yeah. I said, like, wow, that's a really ugly dog. Luke, you want to be the gray man. Most of the time you want to be the gray man, and then you just want to sparkle at various occasions. But in your role, in your lane. I tend to be the Only like the flamboyant, I, you know, the flamboyant, you know, dancer, and it doesn't really go down well. Yeah, so I should probably read no this book. Either. You got to read the book. You got to read the marginalia. You got to read the notes. You got to read the introductions. You got to, you got to. It's one of the most interesting and original works I think that have ever been published. It's it's really in its own category. Uh, it's incredibly literary. It draws incredibly from history, uh, from literature. It's just uh, it's just too good for these retarded uh, commentators that you've been listening to. Uh, what are the chances that you've been conned by pseudo profundity? Something that sounds profound, but upon examination is not profound. Uh, th that's you know it's a reasonable question. I don't think it's applicable here. Um, uh, that's the, <clears throat> remember, leftists are by nature egalitarians, right? Nobody mm -hmm. should stick up. Everyone just has to be this just mediocre schmo, right? They want everybody within the herd and they're going to, uh, you know, 
they're, it's the tall poppy. They're going to lop the head off. The, they're going to lop the the flower, the head off the tall poppy, and this is just an instance of their sort of dim, mediocre, lack of sparkle lives that they lead. It's just a, it's just it's like a testament to their own mediocrity. Don't be suckered in by their retarded mediocrity, Luke. You're better than that, my dude. I also got into a lot of trouble for flatulence in their office. Like, they weren't even in the office. I just, like, went into the office, released my flatulence, you know, came back out. And then, like, 10 minutes later, they came in and they asked me if I had been releasing flatulence in their office. And I think I tried to deny it, but they were pretty firm with me that uh, that was not a great place for me to release my flatulence. Another boss like threatened to throw me out of his moving vehicle at like 70 miles an hour because I like cut one loose. Like, so that's a really bad power move. I found like releasing flatulence in your boss's car or office. I really don't appreciate that. You're not, you're not even on the doorstep of being ready to read this book. You, you need like an elementary school education on these matters. I also got into a lot of trouble. I hung up on the boss's mother. She was kind of rude, and I got a mm-hmm. reprimand. So that's not a that's not a good thing to do. Don't hang up on your boss's mother. And well, well, what's the context? Why would you be talking to your boss's mother in the first place? Well, I had to answer the phones, and so she yeah. called and she wanted to know a bunch of things, and I was just trying to put her off. And then she kind of caught me in some white lies. And then I said, look, I got to take another call. And I just hung up on her. But I, I, I just, I modeled myself on how my boss treated his mother. Like he treated her uh, like crap. So I thought I should walk in his ways. But I got a reprimand. That's a, that's a, very, that's a funny story, dude. Hey, are you going to stick around this winter? Or are you going back to the uh, cottage coast? I, yeah, definitely mixed feelings. Uh, do do very much feel like uh, you know after all the stress and strain I've been under in 2023, maybe I need another three month holiday down under. Yeah, <laughs> just it's, it's the life of you know you, you have a charmed life you lead, Luke. I wish I could do that. It, it might be good off. for my gastrointestinal tract. I, I was, but I watched a video today and it talked about appropriate, inappropriate things to talk about at work, and it said. Uh, unprofessional is to talk about your gastrointestinal issues at work. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. This, I, I just assumed everybody knew this. Oh, well, like um, if you had out of control diarrhea, like that's not something you should bring up in topic. the workplace. No. <laughs> no, no. That's why. See, Luke, there's the types of conversations you have among your 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 friends. You know, in a car. Um, you know, alone. So you can have those conversations in in in, in private, but in in in, uh, in the public, in the workplace, you have to adopt a whole new persona, bro. Yeah, yeah, that's anyway. Really good anyway, advice. read that book. At least listen yeah. to it. Listen yeah. to it. If you're not, if you're too tired to read it, it's yeah. all, the whole thing is on YouTube, and then compare that. You have to admit there's some like nuggets of wisdom in just those quotes that they were mocking. Don't you? Do you agree? I I read his most recent book and I did find nuggets of wisdom in there. So I'm kind of I read his other book, Mastery, which wasn't quite as good as the Forty Eight Laws of Power, but there were still some good things in it as well. So I think he's a very interesting law author. Uh, he has some health problems. For, anyway, hey, did I, you read? I, 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 okay, I, bye. Blessings. All right, blessings. Bye. All right, bless. All right, bless. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Okay. Just approaching the situation in the present, you are putting a lot of meaning onto it. So you might be telling yourself, I'm going to open up to this person. And instead of just telling them the information I'm telling them and noticing how they respond to that, I'm going to tell myself this story around what it means about me as a person. Yeah, I haven't been taking like appropriate note of like what's appropriate to share. And I just like, spill my guts or you know say i'm really struggling with some things and so this woman heidi preem she's great she also has a video on 10 green flags that it's probably safe to be vulnerable 
which I found incredibly helpful. So she is a, a font of, of wisdom for me. So here she are, signs you being overdoing Based on how they receive this information. So if I tell someone about something difficult I've been through, and they don't seem to care, or I feel like they're almost mocking me in response, if I have gone into that situation telling myself, I'm going to determine my worth as a person based on how this person responds to me, that's going to take an incredibly long period of time to recover from. Because I've put so much weight onto that one interaction or onto a series of interactions with this person. If I was only looking to open up to them about one thing and they were to receive it badly, and I didn't put any additional meaning onto them receiving it badly, other than this person doesn't seem to be open to or interested in hearing about this particular thing I'm vulnerable about. It still might hurt or kind of sting if you get the reply that you weren't hoping for, but it's not going to absolutely crush you. I mean, this is a terrific video. I won't play all 29 minutes. Five signs you're overdoing vulnerability. That's me, like in real life, not talking about it on the show, but in, in real life, Inappropriate times, inappropriate places, you know, inappropriate people, you know, say inappropriate things is a bit of an issue I have. I've been Googling verbal impulsivity, and one of the tips is to write things down instead of just blurting them aloud. So here she is, 10 green flags that is probably hey safe guys, to be vulnerable. Hey guys, I'm Heidi Preeb. Welcome okay. to So in this video, we're going to talk about how to know when it is the appropriate time and with whom it is appropriate to be vulnerable with. This is, I found this incredibly helpful. You, you probably think, oh, you know, I already know this stuff, but this really helped me. I mean, I'm only 57. I've only been living in California 45 years. You know, I'm still struggling with the culture. Now, there is no perfect science to this. You can never guarantee that an instance of sharing something vulnerable with another person is going to end well or go in your favor. So what this video is going to talk about is how to make sure that you are at the least making a reasonably safe bet when it comes to opening up and becoming more vulnerable with someone. We're going to talk not just about how to identify the signs of a safe other, but also how to identify green flags inside of yourself that you are at a point where you are emotionally capable of opening yourself up to another person with respect to the fact that it might not go the way you want it to. Sometimes being vulnerable feels bad, doesn't go the way that we would hope, actually creates ruptures in our relationship that we can't find a way to repair. And so figuring out who it might be reasonably safe for you to practice vulnerable self-sharing with is gonna be really instrumental in making sure that you are not- uh, Press one in the chat if you're a safe person for me to share reasonable vulnerability with right now. Press two if you're an unsafe person for me to share that vulnerability with right now. Thank you and God bless. Not senselessly harming yourself by being vulnerable in instances where it doesn't really help you or the other person to do that. So without further ado, we're gonna get into some of the signs or some of the green flags that it's a good time for you to start being vulnerable and she is, is sleeved. I mean, she's got a large number of tattoos and yet so wise. With another person. So green flag number one in the other is that you have seen this person display a pattern of taking their own and other people's emotions seriously. So if we are looking specifically at emotional vulnerability, what we want to be... So I don't know about you, but I found... Not generally a good idea to blurt out to people you barely know in the workplace that you're a sex addict. I mean, that's just my experience. I don't know what your experience is like, but uh, that, that, that didn't work out well for me. Looking at in the other person is do they have a pattern of taking emotions seriously? As opposed to kind of having a pattern of scoffing at, dismissing, or even... Exp yeah, I mean, if you go to... Your typical upper class gay bathhouse, all right, they, they probably have a pattern of taking their own and other feelings seriously. Probably that's like a green flag for you to become vulnerable. Expressing contempt towards their own or other people's more vulnerable emotions. And this is often a trait that you can observe just in everyday conversations or interactions. 
So I remember one time being in a conversation with two kind of new friends, and one of them was telling this story about how he was seeing this girl and she was so obsessed with him. He liked her, but she wanted to get married and have kids and he was so not into that. And the other friend looked at him and went, well, are you gonna talk to her about that? That seems like a pretty important factor in whether or not you guys are gonna continue in a relationship. So I'm surprised you haven't brought it up to her yet. And the stark difference in the emotional maturity there became instantly clear, right? Yeah, I mean, that's true. In the world, there are, you know, emotionally mature, wise people, and there are a lot of uh, emotional terrorists. And uh, that's a great anecdote illustrating the difference between emotional terrorist and uh, someone who is wise. If I were looking for someone to be vulnerable with and to share my feelings with, knowing that those feelings would be relatively safe and taken seriously by the other person, which of those two people would it make more sense to put my trust in? The one who has this kind of air of superiority and contempt around other people having feelings? Or the one who has a more balanced perspective? So little moments like these are the ones you wanna watch out for when you're figuring out who it's safe to be vulnerable around. So green flag is that they don't think other people are weird or weak for having feelings and that you've observed a pattern of them treating other people's feelings seriously and with respect. Sign number two, and this one pertains to the self. It's a green flag that you're likely ready to be vulnerable with someone if you have a clear reason for why you want to be vulnerable with that person. And that- Yeah, I, I needed to hear that. I mean, you are probably a healthy person who didn't need to hear this, but I really needed to hear this, right? That there should be a good reason and that I'm sharing something vulnerable and that what I'm sharing is appropriate to the context of the relationship. Reason is appropriate within the context of your current relationship. So there are many good reasons to be a little bit more vulnerable in relationship. An example might be you are getting to know someone and you wanna test out, what if I get a little bit more personal, a little bit more real with them? How are they gonna respond? Because that's gonna give you information about whether or not you're able to get closer with that person. Being close, I remember I shared in the workplace once that I like to leave like an audible book or audio book running all night because I don't like to be alone with my thoughts. My brain is a dangerous neighborhood that I don't like to enter alone. And this woman went, ah, the, you know, enough, no more about that. And so I had this friendly, you know, almost flirtatious work relationship with this very attractive young woman. But once she heard that I, I like to leave audio box running all night because I don't want to be alone with my thoughts. Uh, that was it. She just like, uh, she just, uh, she just dismissed me completely. Uh, I think she was East Asian. I think they tend to be a bit more conservative about these things, but she went, ah, stop. And, and I thought it was just such an anodyne thing to share. Boy, I am often a terrible judge of what's appropriate to share. Often means doing a little bit of that vulnerable self-sharing that is inherent to co-regulation a lot of the time. But you have to make sure that you are doing this in a way that is appropriate to the context of your current relationship. So if you are on a second date with someone, it might not be appropriate at that point in your relationship to let them know everything about your yeah, I have a history of sharing like way too much, like even before the first date, you know, let alone the, the first date, you know, I go deep and dark and uh, tends to be a little off-putting to some members of the fairer sex. Childhood trauma. We have to look at why we are sharing what we're sharing and whether or not it is the appropriate time and place to share that much. Am I sharing that much? Because I think it actually makes sense for them. So I find it most relaxing at night, usually, to listen to books on, on war. I just find it relaxing, like particularly World War II, uh, like naval battles in the Pacific. I just like to leave those, those running all night. Um, so here, this is, this is what I've been uh, listening to at night. Twilight of the Gods, all right, the Ian Toll trilogy on... U.S. battles in the Pacific during World War II. So for months, on and off, I've been leading, you know, leaving the, that trilogy just running all night. I uh, also like to leave uh, American Carnage by Tim Alberta about the 
Republican journey from 2008 to Donald Trump. I'd like to leave that running all night. I also love Reclaiming History by Vincent Bugliosi. I love to let that just run all night and you know wake up at various points during the Kennedy assassination. I just find it very calming, better than my own thoughts, much more wholesome. Okay, Making of the Atomic Bomb by Richard Rhodes. I also find that uh, you know fairly calming and you know conducive to sleep. The Big Ones by Dr. Lucy Jones about various enormous natural disasters that killed thousands upon thousands of people. I find it very comforting and relaxing to let that run all night. Uh, American Prometheus about uh, Robert Oppenheimer, the guy who gave us the atomic bomb. I tried letting Middlemarch by George Eliot run all night, but uh, that was not conducive to my sleep. A World Undone about World War I, like a 20-hour audio book on the history of World War I. That was very conducive to sleep. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, not conducive to sleep. Pacific Crucible, War at Sea in the Pacific, 1941-42 by Ian Toll, highly conducive to sleep. I did not try The Power Broker uh, about Robert Moses, did not listen to that. Uh, oh, Britain at Bay. So Britain in the first half of World War Two by Alan Allport. So I already listened, read it once very carefully, and then just I found it comforting to let it run all night. The Conquering Tide, War in the Pacific, 1942 to 44. That was very uh, calming. Top of the Morning by Brian Stelter about the TV news business. I like letting that run all night. Uh, Days of Fire about the relationship between George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. Enjoyed letting that run all night. A Man in Fall, the novel by Tom Wolfe. Uh, the Mirror and the Light, so the Hilary Mantel trilogy. Often let that run all night. Uh, Stalin, Volume 1, Volume 2 by Stephen Cochran. Like letting that run all night. Have not tried the decline and fall of the Roman Empire at night. Uh, did not try on the origin of species. Uh, Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mantel. Let that run all night. Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. I would let that run all night. You Are a Comedy Special. Have not tried letting that run all night. Uh, the Peloponnesian War. Have not tried that. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. Did not let that run all uh, The Man Who Ran Washington. So the second time through, about James Baker, I let that run all night. Ah, The Five Families, about the five mafia families. That was very comforting to let that run all night. Uh, the Art of Storytelling, From Parents to Professionals, Writing Creative Nonfiction, did not let those courses run all night. But I did let uh, Manson, Biography by Jeff Gwynn. I found that comforting to let that go all night. Uh, Cloud Street, the novel by Tim Winton. Often let that run all night. Uh, I for years I, I would let Tom Clancy novels run all night. Upon reflection, I don't think that was a good idea. Uh, Helter Skelter by Vincent Bugliosi about the Manson murders. That was that was calming and comforting to let that run all night. Okay, um, so those are those are the main books that I've let uh, run all night. Them to know that much about me on a second date, or am I sharing all of this because in this moment I feel dysregulated, I'm unable to regulate myself around whatever memory has just come up or whatever. Ah, uh, so probably half the time I listen to a kind of meek and mild, gentle uh, playlist that. I quite imaginatively title Sleep. So I've got Agnes Die by Samuel Barber, Let Your Love Flow by the Bellamy Brothers, Rainy Days and Mondays, Superstar by the Carpenters, Top of the World Under Yesterday, Yesterday Once More, I Need to Be in Love, and All You Get from Love is a Love Song by the Carpenters. It's on my sleep playlist. We've only just begun. They long to be close to you. Sing, right? Or by the Carpenters. Uh, Linger by the Cranberries, Miracles by Jefferson Starship. I've got four songs by John Denver on my sleep playlist. 
Take Me Home, Rocky Mountain High, Sunshine on My Shoulders, Any Song, Got Faithfully by Journey, Songbird by Kenny G, The Captain by Casey Chambers, Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen, Tenderfield Saddler by Peter Allen, Early Morning Rain, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Laughing With by Regina Spector, It Must Have Been Love by Roxette. Wait, is this my, yep, this is my sleep playlist, Abide With Me, The Hymn, Kiss Me by Sixpence, None the Richer, Theme from Love Story, The Best of Times by Sticks, Babe by Sticks. You Raise Me Up by Susan Boyle, uh, the entire Chariots of Fire soundtrack, uh, also Vangelis, a lot of Vangelis on my sleep playlist, uh, Ang Ong Ka by Snatam Kaur, and Ong Namo by Snatam Kaur, Can't Stay Away From You by Gloria Estefan, Words Get In The Way, Leaving New York by R.E.M., Cheers theme song, Nearer My God To Thee by Libera, uh, a lot of Debbie Friedman songs like Bahu, Me the Words, Yevarecha, Shir Hamalo, Verstiki Lee, Wedding Vows, Humi Lak, Ufaratza, Free Association, You'll Never Catch the Wind, Imter Tzu, Eliyahu, Dodi Lee, Eight Dodim, Arise My Love, Ashamru, Havat Olam, Mika Elenu, Laugh at All My Dreams, Ani Mamim. So I've got about 60 Debbie Friedman songs. Morning into Dancing, Rukh Shamar, Ashray, Hallelujah. So I got about 60, 70 songs by Debbie Friedman and the You Shall See Visions, Shaki Yanu, Mika Moka, Hodu, Rukh Abod. Uh, so I guess I got 100 songs by Debbie Friedman on my sleep playlist. I got about 40 numbers by Snatam Kaur, including By Thy Grace, Longtime Son, Guru Ram Das Rako Sarana, and who can forget her classic Jap Man Sat Nam, and Et Kong Ka Sat Nam, and Mul Mantra Jap Man Sat Nam Ong Namo Long Time Sun. Right, so I've got 174 songs, 12 hours of one minute on my on my uh, sleep sleep playlist. Feeling I'm experiencing. So I'm putting it all on the table and hoping that they can help return me to equilibrium. The big things, the things that are very raw and intense, for most people don't come up until the relationship is already fairly established. That doesn't mean you can't reference difficult things you've been through. However, if you're looking to do really big, intense co-regulating with a person you don't know that well, it's- Hey, is that what we're doing here? Are we doing really deep, intense co-regulating? It's highly likely that you might need to do some work on adjusting your own boundaries to make sure that you're not practicing reckless vulnerability. Yes, I definitely need to do some work adjusting my own vulnerabilities, my own boundaries, because I'm doing way too much reckless vulnerability. Reckless vulnerability is when we are not establishing boundaries around who it is and is not safe for us to be vulnerable with. We are simply handing over all of our psychological stuff to anyone who we think will listen because we don't know how to self-regulate around it. Yeah, that's, that's my life story. Ourselves. And if you struggle to figure out where the limits are in this capacity, try asking friends, loved ones, maybe a therapist if you're able to talk to one, what they think is appropriate in terms of how much to share when in a relationship. I, I like to ask Elliot Blatt. But the important part here is that if you are able to zoom out and put in proper context why you're sharing, what you're sharing, when you're sharing it, you're also going to be able to properly contextualize whatever response you get. So if you are sharing something with someone because you're trying to get to know them better and you test it out and you find that they're kind of closed off or that they have a reaction that doesn't make you feel very good in response to what you shared, now you have information, right? You learn, okay. She's great. I love this woman. She has so much wisdom for a person who's got mad number of tattoos. And this woman's great too. Jennifer Brick, co-workers are not your friends. Who knew? Why people are there at work. I would say that everyone is there because they need a paycheck. Now, need a paycheck, want a paycheck, whatever it is, it's all a matter of semantics. People are at work because they want to get paid. They are there to make money or they are there because they are trying to build success for themselves professionally. Trust me, if neither of those things mattered, they would just be volunteering or staying at home on their couch with some bonbons and some Dr. Phil. 
I don't know, maybe that's just me. Now here's the thing, between those two different options where someone is there just to get paid and to go home, and between the person that is there because they want to climb the ladder, the first person might not be personally invested in that company and in the people that they work with, where the second person might be so invested in their own success that they are willing to throw their best friend, their mother, their cousin, their sister, whoever under the bus to get there. You don't want to be someone who gets caught in that pathway. Now also with all of the in-between, every workplace has its gossip. And one of the ways that you become ensnared in the gossip is to be talking about yourself and things that don't have any place in a professional setting. I swear to God, I just felt the thumbs down buttons being clicked right now. But I think that this is really important for you to hear because the people that you're friends with and work, even though you spend all of your time and maybe you have happy hours with them and you have your team events, the thing is at some point, one of you is going to move on and it's going to be exceptionally rare for that person to stay in your life in a meaningful way. If you ever watched Fight Club, you know the reference of a single serving friend. A work friend is just basically a single serving friend who has multiple servings as long as you happen to go to the same office to work at every single day. Now does it mean that that person is going to fall off the face of the earth if you no longer work with them and never speak to you again? No, but you're probably not going to speak to them all the time, you're probably not going to see them all the time. And yes, there are exceptions, but trust me, you probably know the difference between the exception and the rule. I want you to treat those real, authentic, and life-changing friendships that can be formed at work as the exception rather than the rule. And in fact, I actually believe that more of the relationships that you have at work are likely to form into those really substantial personal friendships when you follow these guidelines. And that's why you need these three guidelines to be friendly, but not friends at work. The first guideline is knowing where to draw the line. I'm never going to be one of those people that advocates for you being totally closed off, all business all the time, super professional, don't talk about your personal life at all. No, you work with these people every single day. You probably want them to know a little something about you. You probably want to know a little something about them as well. And if you don't, totally cool, but then you're probably not watching this video in the first place. Here's the thing, ultimately you are going to have to navigate for you where the lines are between your personal and your professional life. You also need to learn where the lines are. So press one if this is just common sense to you, because I, I didn't really realize this. For the people around you. And for this, I really encourage you to keep it superficial. I encourage you to run the things that you share through a filter. Does this make me look professional or unprofessional? Now, just for fun, let's have a little pop quiz so that we can tell the difference between the two. Now, for each of those scenarios, I want you to tell me if it was professional or unprofessional. Tally up your score and leave it in the comments down below. Oh my God, I'm so, I'm so drunk that I threw up all over the floor and then I club yeah so this chick she was like a 10 I went to see the new play that was out over the weekend I just bought a new DSLR and so I actually spent the weekend in the Lower East Side photographing the buildings I went out to eat at that new restaurant and I was just having the worst gastro issues ever Now drawing from the first guideline, the second guideline is to keep it superficial. Now as we went through that quiz, there was one thing that you noticed, which is probably that the unprofessional was giving a little bit too much information. But where- Yeah, I, I, I've had a teeny weeny bit of an issue with that. All right, this is Welsh boy Treble Kai Thomas, 12 years old, saying something called Sugan.
bye.